Good morning, my name is Shimon Shkuri of Ariel Property Advisors and I'd like to invite you for our multi-family breakfast. This is a multi-family, uh, this is a discussion about the multi-family market in New York City and we have a great panel of active players. Please enjoy, thank you. Trying to project what's going to happen, we looked at two equations. One is the supply side and the other is the demand. We looked at the supply side. We expected higher capital gain taxes. We believe it's going to lead to price expectations or higher price expectations by sellers and therefore less supply, less sales in the first quarter of the year. And this will result in a very low inventory, uh, which really happened. On the demand side, we expected rents to continue to rise, and they did. We uh, believe that the Fed uh, would continue their commitment to keeping interest rates low. And that happened. What we didn't expect is a, ch is a jump in interest rates without the Fed's intervention, which did happen uh, this year and somewhat affected the market, but not really. Um, so these higher fund fundamentals and, you know, resulted in higher demand. And the net result between supply and demand um, last year was higher, much higher multifamily pricing for 2013 as we believe is going to happen. And we believe that we'll close this year. Uh, it's going to be a record year, both on a, mostly on pricing, but also possibly on transaction uh, volume. Today's market. So we're in 2013, and we're looking at two factors. One is the transaction volume, and the second is pricing. Year to date, uh, for the multifamily asset class only, please bear in mind I'm talking only about multifamily assets in New York City. The dollar volume year to date is $5.4 billion, 5% higher than 2012. Uh, transaction volume 462, or 2%, 2% more than 2012, so very similar, and 14% more buildings traded year to date than 2012. As you can see from the graph, uh, 2013 started as a very uh, started very slow in the first quarter, but has picked up steam for the rest of the year as a result of some major transactions that took place. We believe that continuing this year and ending this uh, last quarter, we'll see continued transactions, and um, we're going to experience the same, if not more, transactions that we've seen in 2012 uh, for the multifamily sector. If you look at pricing. We've seen some record pricing throughout the five boroughs. When we price properties on the multifamily asset class, we talk about, about price per unit, we talk about price per square foot, capitalization rate, and gross and multiples. In New York City, we're currently seeing all of these matrix above record levels, with Manhattan <coughs> below 96 leading the way. So if you look at Manhattan below 96, average prices per foot are $600, average capitalization rates are at 4.5, and average gross and multiples are 15 times. Now, these are lagging indicators in many cases. These are comparables or these are transactions that took place already. If we look at transactions that we have in the pipeline or we know about, um, the indicators are even higher in terms of pricing. In many cases, cap rates are below 4% for properties below 96, especially if they have a major value add component. So we have to ask ourselves, what are the drivers? What drives the pricing so high? And, you know, we believe that there are two main factors in today, today's market. The first is uh, the residential rents, and the second, again, in the multifamily sector, are the interest rates in the interest rate environment. So the first driver, the residential rents, average, average rents today are approximately $60 per square foot or slightly above where they were in 2007, 2008. Let's remember that we're in an environment or economic environment where unemployment is still 8%. If you compare that to 2007 where unemployment was 4%, we still have a lot of room to grow. And we're looking at the reasons, when we're looking at the reasons of why rents are so, so high and going up, there's, there's several of them. So the first reason is the preference of rent versus buy. 
Credit is still tight and inventory at all times low. Um, on the demand side, there are more jobs in New York City. You know, New York City continues to create jobs. If you look at statistics between August 2012 and August of 2013, 85,000 private sector jobs were created. Um, another factor is student housing. So universities, NYU, Columbia, Cornell Tech, all of you I'm sure heard about their expansion, are expanding in the city in Roosevelt Island in Upper Manhattan. And that creates a city that's a magnet to young people, definitely a positive factor. And last but not least, the tech sector, affecting, very positively affecting rents commercial rents, but also residential rents um, as it comes to the city. Not only in Manhattan, but also in Brooklyn. The second driver, as I mentioned uh, a minute ago, is the interest rates. And although we've seen, we've seen a jump in interest rates recently, that's stabilized. Uh, and interest rates are still 250 to 300 basis points below what they were in 2007. So definitely a pricing drive. One of the things we reviewed um, is our transactions that took place in 2013 and also took place in 2007. And we chose to highlight a few of these transactions. Uh, bear in mind that Manhattan, we, we, took four, four, we took four transactions as an example. Um, two of them in Manhattan below 96, one in Manhattan above 96, and one in Queens. Uh, bear in mind that Manhattan appreciated more dramatically than, than other places. And all of these plays were what we believe to be value-added plays. So clearly, these buildings have had rent appreciation as a result or between 2007 and 2013. But still, you'll see the difference in pricing and the strength of this market. The first example is the Westbrook portfolio, which was purchased mainly in 2007. One building was purchased in 2012. It was sold this year recently. Um, when it was sold in 2007, the price per foot was 450. Today it's 700 dollars. 55 percent increase in value in 2007 and 2013 shows the strength of the market. The second example from Manhattan is the CIT building, 650 Madison Avenue. While this is an office building, it was sold to a residential converter and um, was sold for 2100 a foot, a 91 percent increase compared to what it was sold for in 2007. Again, shows the strength of the luxury apartment market. 2013, one of our panelists here purchased Saxon Hall for 15 percent more than what it was purchased in 2007. They'll tell you more about this transaction, but again, you see the difference. I mean, yes, there's appreciation between 2000 and two, 2007 and 2013 in Queens, but the appreciation is not as strong, um, and, uh, but there's still appreciation, so pricing is still higher even in the bars. And lastly, we handled a sale on Broadway uptown earlier this year where we sold the building for $11.4 million, almost 11.4, 51% increase compared to the 2007 purchase, uh, we can tell you that there was, a, there was a tremendous value add that the owner put into the building. So it wasn't, uh, the 51% was justified, not just by the market, but also by the asset itself. So one, one, one more thing to mention is we believe that the buyers who purchased these buildings, to the most part, are value add buyers, which means that their, their outlook at the market, at least for the near future, is very rosy and, um, and very bullish. So we want to look at 2014 and try to predict or try to say where we had it. And it's really, it was really difficult this year. So we looked at the headwinds and we looked at the advantages in this market. And we, look at, we looked at headwinds. We had to ask ourselves questions about the macroeconomy and the microeconomy. And I don't know that we can answer all these questions, but these are observations that we all will have to figure out throughout the year. On a macro level, there's a changing of Fed chairman that could lead to a change in Federal Reserve policy. And clearly, that's possibly going to affect interest rates. As I said before, investors are super sensitive to interest rates even before Fed intervention. The potential of fiscal policy change could slow down the sum of the US economy. And this could drive to lower growth and lower rents. 
That's one effect that could happen on a micro level. On a micro level, New York City is expecting a new mayor. We don't know how the new mayor is going to respond or the city is going to respond to landlord tenant issues, specifically DHCR. We're also not sure about taxation. Property taxes have gone up dramatically over the past few years. We expect that to continue, but is that going to even accelerate? And not just property taxes, but also income taxes for residents in New York City could affect real estate pricing. In terms of uh, micro-level economic issues, we have to ask ourselves if rents have finally peaked. We at Ariel don't think so, but it's definitely a question to ask as rents are very high today. And is the supply that's coming on the market, the supply of units, residential units that's coming on the market, will outpace the demand? There's about 24,000 units that are coming on the market between this year and 2015. Now, we don't think that is okay or that is an issue, but this is a, these are questions we have to ask ourselves. Now let's look at the advantages of New York City. It continues, the city continues to be, uh, to have a status of a safe haven for investments. Capital that's coming is coming locally, nationally, and internationally. 2013 is something that we definitely felt had a lot of international capital coming into deals. Um, the fundamentals are very strong. Net positive job creation, as I mentioned before. Razor thin vacancy as a result of that, 1.3%. Tight multifamily inventory. Uh, tenant diversification. We have the tech industry and the student housing as advantages in New York City. So, if we had to conclude, where do we see 2014? We'll call it moderation and not acceleration. So these lots of question marks that really predict where this market is heading in the longer term. 2014, we'll have to reevaluate all these questions. But we believe that the prices will stay stable plus, meaning they might appreciate a bit, but not to the same levels that they did in 2013. We believe we'll see stable volume of transactions as well. But we'll definitely have to watch interest rates, watch the local economy, what is the new mayor and the new cities does, and uh, what's the federal government. So with that, we believe we're going to have a good year, but we'll have to, again, monitor what's going to happen next. That concludes my presentation, and I'd like to uh, continue and present our panelists. So we have three panelists here today. All of them are one of the most active players in today's multifamily market. They'll all tell you about themselves in a second. To my right, Danny Benedict of Benedict Realty Group. Then Adam Mermelstein of Treetop Development. And last but not least, Bennett Berger of BCB Properties. So what I'd like to do is have each one of the panelists present themselves in one or two minutes, and then we'll start asking questions and hopefully make it interesting. Danny, would you like to start? Good morning. Um, good morning, Shimon. Thank you. Uh, my name is Daniel Benedict, and I've been uh, what you call an active player in the real estate market. And I'd like to say I'd, I like to call it active in the real estate market for the last uh, 25 years. Um, this year has been a particularly uh, busy year. We've acquired um, three separate, um, we closed on three separate transactions, which total over 700 units. Um, I uh, specialize in multifamily. I would say um, my subspecialty is multifamily in Bath, Queens, Brooklyn. We had some properties in Bronx and, and, and some in Manhattan, but our primary focus is Queens and Brooklyn. And um, in, um, in the medical office building uh, business. The, um, I guess we're going to be discussing it. Um, you're going to have a, uh, a Q&A. You're going to have some yes. Q&A and yes. questions. But that, I'll, I'll just add. I think that uh, I think the most critical point, uh, from um, which has been keeping the market very very strong, is the enormous amount of capital which is flowing into New York City. There's an enormous amount of capital coming from all sources, um, nationally. International, of course, but even just in here uh, in America, I just uh, had meetings with a major oil company which just allocated $500 million to buy multifamily in New York City. Uh, 
you know, it's, it's quite uh, surprising, but uh, they, they, they are looking for yield, they're looking for a safe investment, they're looking for a safe harbor, and New York is a, uh, we've done, uh, we've raised capital in our last few deals internationally, from, from the UK, Switzerland, Canada, Israel, uh, Beirut, uh, it's just, it's coming from all over, and uh, that's really what I think is keeping uh, the pricing so strong and the valuation so, so high. Uh, you know, rents could go higher, they can, we don't know, we'll discuss it in our panel, but I think that um, the capital is really what's driving the market at this time. Thank you, Dan. Good morning, Adam Ernolstein. I, uh, I started Treetop Development with my partner, Ozzy Mendel, back in 2005. When we initially started, we, we launched as a development company. We were building ground up development deals in Jersey City, Hoboken, in Williamsburg, and Greenpoint. Once the market hit in 2007, 2008, uh, we sort of transitioned our business plan more into the multi-family space, the value-add opportunistic type deals. Uh, we started buying in Jersey primarily in the last two years or so. Uh, we've become fairly active players in, I guess, the northern Manhattan space. Um, even over the last six months, I've certainly noticed the lack of product on the market, and so we've you know, sort of stretched our boundaries. Uh, beyond that 100th to 135th Street corridor, which is on the west side, which is primarily where we were focused. Um, that prompted the purchase of Saxon Hall and Rico Park Queens. Uh, we bought that about six months ago. We've also extended our, um, our purchasing up into the Inwood and Washington Heights section, and uh, we're still you know, active in Jersey at the same time. We have a, a different, you know, completely uh, sort of divergent business plan, which is to buy cash loan properties. Those are HUD properties outside of uh, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. Um, and those are basically cash flow, whereas the city stuff is more value added. So on a cash flow basis, uh, the yields might not be there, but over, you know, two, three, four, five years, the appreciation is, and if we're successful in our business plan and executing it, then uh, there's you know real money to be made. I think the the, the four uh, slides that Shimon showed they sort of um, they illustrate exactly what the New York real estate market is about. If you can properly execute a business plan in the value add space, there's you know a lot of money to be made, and that's why you know these type of deals, which I assume we all do, are um, you know highly sought after. Hello. Hi, uh, my name is Bennett Berger. Um, about three years ago, uh, my mom and I founded uh, BCB Properties. Uh, hi, mom. <laughs> um, we wanted to be a Manhattan-based uh, multifamily buyer at the time, um, but uh, what I found was that it was just a little too competitive for um, my demeanor. So uh, I decided that we should uh, implement a Manhattan business plan that a lot of people had done in low rent, rent stabilized buildings in Brooklyn. Uh, and uh, we made our first purchase uh, about two and a half years ago. Uh, we bought nine buildings across the street from uh, the arena, uh, which we subsequently sold to Thor this year. And ever since then, um, we realized there was a lot of value in Brooklyn and we could buy properties with tremendous upside um, at fairly low price per square foot. And we've now scaled uh, the plan so that we're in uh, basically every neighborhood in what I call Northern Brooklyn from Greenpoint to Crown Heights. Um, we still buy in Manhattan. We uh, own some buildings in the East Village and we're a little bit active uh, in Upper Manhattan, uh, near the Columbia area, uh, but our primary focus is Brooklyn, and uh, beyond that, our primary focus is uh, executing our business plan in neighborhoods, entire neighborhoods that are untouched uh, in that regard. Um, we're having a great time. Uh, the market is active. Um, we, there's plenty of product out there for us. We think, sometimes we don't think, but today I think so. Um, and uh, things are good. Brooklyn's just getting started. There's a lot of growth still to happen. And uh, we're going to continue to be uh, aggressive. Thank you.
So just to start off and actually build on what Lennon just said or started saying about locations, in terms of geographies in New York City, where does each one of you see value? Where do you invest in? And what do you see in these locations? Um, Danny, would you like to start? Or Adam? I think I sort of answered already, but I'll answer again. Um, I think our primary focus in Manhattan is between 100th and 135th Street on the west side. Uh, you know, 15 years ago, people, there was this line in the sand at 96th Street and nobody would cross over it. It was known as, you know, the other side of the tracks. And over time, we've seen that line continue to expand north. Uh, I think even, you know, just two, three years ago, people would look at 125th Street and say, you know, it's different on north of 125th Street. I can tell you that we own a building on 127th Street, we own a building on 116th Street, and we own one on 106th Street. And other than the age, the economics, and the financial stability of the, of the resident is exactly the same. Um, I think in this, you know, kind of small geographic area, you're getting people who are young professionals who are looking for somewhat of a deal as opposed to being, let's say, below 96th Street. And I think that's going to continue to push up and push up. As we see that, I think that rents will, you know, kind of continue to rise in this area. At the same time, it's becoming uh, increasingly difficult to find new product, which is why we're expanding north. I, I personally have spent a fair amount of time now in uh, the Inwood section of Manhattan, which is just north of Washington Heights. I like it because it has, well, the transportation obviously is somewhat lacking. Um, the parks are there, which other than, you know, Central Park, is not a real, um, you know, asset of New York City. So you have like two or three parks there that are really beautiful, really nice. You have old pre-war buildings, large apartments that will um, be very conducive to young professionals who are looking for a share, which is a way that we're able to, you know, maximize our dollars on the rent value, right? If we have three people paying $800, $2,400 a month, whereas, you know, one person in the three-bedroom, we're just not gonna get that. So that's certainly an area that uh, we're looking at. And then beyond that, we're continuing to look at Queens. The problem with Queens being, while we like it in the sense that there are a lot of uh, large buildings, and we think that the areas are going to continue to improve and continue to gentrify, and you know, sort of the economics of these areas are going to improve, um, it, it's a lot of long-term ownership, difficult to buy new products, and difficult to break into these markets. I think a little differently. I think that um, there are opportunities everywhere. Uh, there, is, there are no bad areas in New York anymore. Uh, the the uh, market is stable and strong and strengthening everywhere. We're buying properties now in Bushwick and, and in, in, in Bed-Stuy areas where we didn't, 10 years ago, we, would never, we wouldn't drive through the area. Uh, just, there are no bad areas and there are opportunities everywhere. Uh, and uh, you just got to find the right, you got to look hard and find the right deal, but there are, um, there are no bad areas in New York City anymore. You've been investing heavily in Queens, uh, in certain areas there, uh, for years. Uh, what, what do you see in this market that's unique for, for multifamily? Is that the stability? What is it? You know, whether you're renting to the investment banker or to the dishwasher, which is working in the restaurant for uh, the investment banker as much, uh, there is, um, although you talk about 14 or 20,000 new units coming in the market, none of them are geared for the middle class or the lower middle class or the working class. And uh, there is an enormous demand for these, if, uh, for that kind of housing, the vacancy rate, which is basically which is nil, zero, near zero. We, um, on our, we have 6,000 unit portfolio, and, and we, we basically have low vacancies, units turn over on the we bought the package a few months ago. There were 24 vacancies in 160 days. I, I think that, um, you know, Queens, um, there are no bad areas in Queens. There are no, almost no bad areas in Brooklyn. Um, the difference between Brooklyn and Queens is that uh, Brooklyn has been gentrifying very fast. Um, Queens has been always very stable. It's a middle class, um, strong, uh, very ethnic neighborhood. With, and and uh, it's always been very stable, a lot of demand. And um, you're not gentrifying the neighborhood, you're gentrifying the building, you're improving the building that you're buying, you're making them, you're renovating the 
locking the units and, and you're uh, creating value that way, but uh, it's, it's still there. there. It's a very small market. In terms of, I mean, Bennett, maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, locations and also tenancy. Well, I want to give you, I'll give you some interesting locations. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'll give you one that you probably know, and I know Adam knows because he was like the first person to do something cool there. And then I'll give you one that's a little bit more obscure. So my favorite location to be in is South Williamsburg. It has a special place in my heart. It's basically the new Lower East Side or the East Village, whichever. You have a lot of uh, Spanish-speaking people and a lot of Orthodox and Hasidic Jewish people, which actually, when you think about it, it's exactly what the Lower East Side was. Um, why do I love it? We get great rents. There's a lot of, there's tons of undermanaged buildings. Uh, they're hard to get at, but boy, people just neglected all their property there for many years. Tremendous subway access. Now that the JMZ, at the Marcy stop on the JMZ, you can go, you can take the J to downtown Manhattan, where the World Trade Center is going to open, or you can take the M to Midtown. So that's great, and you're one stop out of the city. Right now we're getting rents in uh, South Williamsburg, which, this blows my mind, north of $65 a foot, which is like, I think probably what Manhattan rents, you, like that was considered a strong Manhattan rent not that long ago. So if you can uh, renovate your apartments correctly and, and cut them up, because that's what Adam and I do, we you know, make, take small apartments and then build them so that people can share them. Um, what's that? You make them bigger, sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> the only problem with South Williamsburg is that it went from being a, when we started there, it was $175 a foot. Now you find buildings. One traded recently for $425 a foot. So it's hard to keep up with that. The other neighborhood that I really like right now, it's a little bit more obscure, is Southwestern Crown Heights, which to me is the uh, area... Uh, south of Franklin, uh, west of Nostrand, and I'm not, I guess, and, and, and east of the park. I don't really know where the, where the southern border is, but that's where it is. Uh, we started buying a lot over there, um, mainly because I, I'm kind of obsessed with price per foot, so we can buy between, because that really tells you, like, to me, you know, if I can create the potential, then that's, that's a good metric for me. So we can buy sub $200 a foot, and I rented an apartment yesterday for $47 a foot, which, that's pretty simple math. I mean, if you can rent for 40, five or 200 and rent for 47, that's good. All right, so, um, and, and there's great subway access. There's four, another thing I'm obsessed with, subway access. There's four express trains at Franklin and Eastern Parkway, which can take you to Midtown or Downtown. So those are my two favorite areas, Southwestern Crown Heights and South Williamsburg. In terms of tenancy, I mean, who are the tenants in your buildings? How do you find them? And, you know, have it, you know, did you see a change in the past few years of tenancy in the locations you're investing? I think today is still a landlord's market. So I don't have to post on Craigslist. I don't have to advertise. I don't have to put signs outside my buildings. The brokers are coming to me. Um, and, and everybody. Um, but in any case, you have, we have a fair sized brokerage network who we work with, who bring us tenants. Um, I would say typically an apartment will get rented once renovated within a week. Um, oftentimes it's renovated, it's rented even before it's renovated in, uh, in our target areas. So there's sort of different um, you know, demographics in Manhattan. I think we're getting young in, in the Harlem area, let's say, we're getting a young professional, probably more of a RT type than a, a financial, um, than somebody in the finance field. Um, we get, you know, a lot of different uh, ethnicities and race. Um, I think it's the same up in Inwood. I, in Queens, it's a bit more, um, I guess, working blue collar, but we are seeing uh, a fair amount of people in finance. I think it's also a little bit um, less diverse in certain neighborhoods and a lot more focused on either you know your ethnicity and race and that sort of creates a driving force 
behind uh, people coming to Queens, whereas Manhattan is sort of a melting pot of you know a lot of different uh, folks. Um, basically, it. tenants. Any comments on tenants? Uh, sure. Um, Williamsburg is all kids right out of college. Everybody's under 26 years old. Uh, and the rest of Brooklyn is a lot of families. A lot of young people, but there are a lot of families in the neighborhoods. We're in Carroll Gardens. I mean, Crown Heights is people looking for bigger apartments for less money. Uh, nobody can afford Park Slope anymore. It's insane how much Park Slope costs. One subway stop away. Um, but you know, when you're, when you're in the walk-up business, you don't get a lot of families because families don't live in walk-up buildings, generally speaking. So um, yeah, we're, we're, our target is you know, 22 to 30, I guess. Uh, and a lot of people still have the guarantors and or their parents paying rent or you know, whatever it is. And so you're, we're talking about rents and how rents are increasing. And you know, I heard about tenants that are younger. Um, and we've seen that rents increased year over year for several years. And so one of the questions I have is about, you know, can, can he climb further? Can he go higher? And if so, why? What, what, do you, what is your thought about that? I think there are a few things to kind of note. The first thing is, because we're renting to young professionals, it's a seasonal business. So people are coming in between May through November. That's going to be your hot time. You're going to be able to rent probably for five to seven percent more now than you are come, you know, dead of winter in January. So, you know, that that's the first thing I think. Whereas a lot of people feel that rent stabilization um, is a bad thing, I actually think it's a good thing. I think it helps to increase the amount of rent because it sort of creates for this uh, this fixed amount of apartments which aren't luxury and which aren't rent controlled. So, you know, that, that in, between, in, in between stage, which are apartments that we all specialize in, uh, are really, you know, not well serviced and it allows us to uh, creep the prices up. I also think if you look just historically for at Manhattan, it's continuing to get better as long as the administration uh, is, uh, I guess, continues on the path that the uh, current one is on, then uh, I, I think we're gonna see you know, more money poured into New York City. Uh, there's better subway access today than there was 10 years ago on the east side, and you know, going to be better access on the west side as well. Uh, development is strictly high end, so this, you know, like Bennett said, this walk-up business or kind of these, you know, or the sort of just the general business that we're in is a really defined niche that nobody is doing other than just improving the existing apartments that are there. So I think that we are going to continue to see a uh, rise in rents. I don't think it's going to be as dramatic as we've seen over the last two years, but I definitely think that we will. The last factor is inflation. We haven't seen inflation you know, for several years now. And if inflation kicks in, then it becomes a new ball game. Well, I, I'll, um, you know, unlike Bennett, I don't discriminate on age. Uh, we welcome all the tenants, and um, <laughs> our tenancy is primarily, I mean, we do have some walk-ups and some properties in Manhattan which cater to the 26 and older, but most of our senior buildings are 26 and older, and uh, we have families and tenants from every, every uh, just every range. Um, as uh, Adam says, uh, we don't look for them, they find us. Uh, I think that there's been an unusual growth in rents in the last three years. We've experienced almost 10% year over year in the last three years, and I think that's due to slow, that, that will slow down. Um, the nature of our business is to buy properties, to buy properties which are um, where, where the average rent is way below the market. Uh, they're rent regulated, and of course, upon turnover, we, we're able to raise the rent substantially by renovating the apartments. But on turnover of market rents, I think that we're going to look at, at basically inflation uh, numbers and, and just a couple of percent a year for the next year or two. Rents have to catch the breath. So, so stable rents, okay. And you know, with that, just looking into 2014, again, each one of you here has been very active in, in buying this year. What is your business plan for 2014? Do you think that you'll be able to buy, although pricing has gone up so much and so high and so fast? Or do you think it's going to be difficult? What's your prediction for 2014? 
uh, if, you, if you can put it. Well, I, I mean, I think in Brooklyn we're going to see some record prices. I know we're going to see some record prices because of the offers that we're getting on some of our stuff are just astronomical. I mean, numbers that somebody offered us, uh, I, you know, I'm not going to tell you what it is, but over $850 a foot for two of our multifamily buildings in Brooklyn, which, I mean, I, I can't even, like, grasp how that number is, is just enormous. So for us, I think we're going to shed some assets, certainly, just because we have to take advantage of the market that is in front of us. And I think as long as we can, you know, our specialty is finding the next area. I mean, that's what I, that's what I pride myself on doing. So, uh, you know, hopefully we can continue uh, our business plan while people still think we're crazy for paying certain prices in certain areas and uh, really uh, amass a nice portfolio while we can. Care to share what you think that next area may be? <laughs> I told you Southwestern Crown Heights, right? <laughs> higher on a cap point basis than what they were um, a year ago or 18 months ago. So I think that um, there will be transactions. Prices are going to stay basically where it is now, and we're going to wait and see what happens to rates. Thank you. And uh, one of the things I'd like to do is open it up for questions, if people have questions for, for our panelists here. Um, Yes, Charlie, only one piece of construction. As you know, I'm in the ground up construction business in the city. You guys probably see enough cranes, a lot of new product. Uh, in addition to buying existing buildings, fixing them, getting better rents, when does it make sense that I see a lot of people buying buildings, knocking them, and putting up high end luxury uh, apartments? So you're asking to develop? When does it, yeah, when does it make sense to just, rather than buying a building, you think to be a landlord of rent to, to do a new? Uh, ground up construction. Is there, is there some business model that these guys are, or is it more just strictly buying the rent? Well, luxury housing is coming up and is being built as we speak. Um, but the question is, was, uh, on the at what time does it become 
economically uh, interesting to, to buy existing housing, tear it down, build new housing, new luxury uh, development. Uh, luxury development is happening. You see cranes uh, on every corner, as you know, being in industry. I think what we're not seeing now is the kind of development that we've seen in the boroughs in Brooklyn and in Queens. Uh, that has slowed down, and there were the smaller developers, and this has slowed down primarily because credit, the construction financing is, is very difficult to get by today. Okay. By the way, that's, that's, part, that's one part, the development aspect of, of the multifamily business uh, that is doing okay but not doing as great, mostly because of construction loans. and. You see construction around the city, it's mostly luxury apartment buildings, there's some of it in Brooklyn as well, smaller, on a smaller scale. Um, and I think that's actually something we're, we're missing. So that could help the market, not necessarily, um, you know, that's something that we're waiting for to happen. Hopefully banks are opening up the construction lines and uh, allow us to build more. Uh, I would just like to add two points. I think one of the things that we're seeing uh, in this cycle as opposed to the last cycle is and I was involved in the last cycle of development, everybody was building for condos. If it didn't work as a condo, if, if it failed as a condo, it certainly didn't work as a rental. So what happened was the market crashed and everybody was screwed. And so you basically lost your building and you don't have to rent it at a loss. I think this time the banks are a little smarter, a lot smarter. And uh, I actually think it's, it's easier today in some ways um, to get smart financing, but, and you can get non-recourse construction financing, but at the same time, uh, it has to work as a rental. And so you're seeing more rental buildings go up as opposed to the condos, which is what we saw last cycle. Second thing, and, and I don't know if these guys would agree with me, I think at the end of every cycle, you see this uh, strategy shifting. So it, it would be guys like us who are in the multifamily space, and we say, wow, we can't find any deals. So let's go and we're going to build. And that's the time when the market is going to go down. That's my feeling. So, we are, I personally am trying to stay away um, from that development ditch and you know, I, I think that it's when you're looking for other avenues to make money but if you can't make it in your own space, that is you know, a driver of mistakes. So. properties that you regret buying in the last five years um, in per any particular neighborhoods? No. <laughs> I, I regret a lot of properties that didn't buy. <laughs> it's not that hard to look smart if you bought something in the past three or five years because everybody who did look smart. So, I mean, that's a market thing. Let's see when something bad happens where we all end up, you know? Yeah, I, I completely agree. One of the amazing things about New York City, especially as an up and up market, is it, it fixes all mistakes. And so, in the last five years, if you didn't do anything, then you know your property has appreciated probably 30, 40 percent in value. Um, I see one of the panel is talking about the safety port in New York. I can see, I, I basically come from Hong Kong. I see that a lot of uh, investors coming from Asia, Hong Kong, China, particularly in China. Well, do you have any statistics where for the last time, uh, for a couple of years, how many percent of uh, 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 the property being rented or sold to the foreign investor? Uh, how many and how many percent come from Asia or Europe? And do you see a trend will be continuing in that direction in the one or two years? I can uh, answer anecdotal, anecdotally, really, because um, not from first-hand uh, experience, but. It's been a very, uh, there has been an increasing trend in Asian capital flowing into the New York market. It's certainly still very, very small compared to other international sources, but it is growing. Uh, I can't give you percentages, but I do hear about transactions which are being, which, which are being capitalized by uh, Asian capital, and it is growing. You hear more and more about these, uh, these, these uh, investments. I think, though, that uh, the Asian capital prefers the uh, marquee show free properties and divine they're investing into the uh, known uh, Manhattan office towers and, and uh, not so much in, in, in apartment houses in, in Manhattan, Queens, and Brooklyn. But to, to elaborate on that question, in terms of international capital, 
I assume each one of you sees that coming into their deals. And do you see that increasingly coming to your deals more than two or three or four years ago, or it's at the same rate? I see it increasing rapidly. Uh, I also see it increasing. You know, we have a lot more uh, international and you know both institutional and private investors today than we have in the last four years. But I am you know nervous that if the United States were to default on debt, I think. Yeah, I think China holds, you know, 1.2 trillion, and Japan is right behind them. And so, I think that we would see a, uh, a mass exodus of, you know, money coming into the United States. Thank you, Steve Lorenzo from Eddie Hank Friedman. Thank you for coming um, today. Uh, I have a question that relates to a fellow not mentioned. Uh, we've seen, and I've been tracking a lot of deals, obviously in uh, Manhattan and Queens. And, uh, in Brooklyn, but where uh, in the port your portfolios, or where do you see the Bronx and about that whole other brown borough in the um, in dynamics? I mean, I, I we in, in our in our office, my, you know, my mother's been a real estate broker for many years, and in our office. The Bronx is like a bad word, so I really have no, like, I'm just saying, I know the multiples have gone up, like, Danny can probably tell you they yeah. were. We own a couple of buildings, uh, about 300 units in the Bronx. Our basis in these buildings is very low, and um, um, we're keeping them the cash money properties. The Bronx is, you really have to be very, very active in the Bronx to make money in the Bronx. You have to be in the city and state agencies every day. It's extremely management intensive. It's more of a, um, the intrinsic value, I'm not talking of course about Riverdale or some other small areas of the Bronx, but in the Bronx, it's more a, um, a business of uh, managing cash flow, which is generated by all kinds of government programs. And um, with the headaches that come with government programs. But the intrinsic value of the property is not as apparent. But when you see trades in the Bronx, it's like five guys like just going back and forth between them all the time, you know? <laughs> There's not that many people, really. Hello. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. The question that comes to mind is how do all three of you deal when it comes to dealing with uh, um, Section 8 housing? Or you just go by and hope for the best before you turn around. Do you have any Section 8 housing in your portfolio? You have some. Once in a while, once in a while, we get a tenant or two, and it's a pain in the butt. <laughs> That's kind of what I got. <laughs> there, are the different, there are different types of Section 8. You have voucher-based program, and you have project-based Section 8. I, I think what you're referring to is the, uh, the voucher-based, and in our buildings, which are you know, in more uh, up and coming and established areas, we're probably not uh, getting an influx of these Section 8 vouchers. Um, I would guess that they're, you know, probably going to certain pockets of Upper Manhattan, such as Washington Heights, but even then it's, you know, few and far between, probably more focused on the Bronx. On the project-based Section 8 side, uh, you know, we have a fair sized portfolio outside of uh, this area, which, like I said, is, you know, strictly capital-based. Yeah, the project-based Section 8 is a, just a different business. It's a different animal. It happens also in the city, you know, it is in the Bronx, it is in, in, in all the boroughs, actually. It's just a different business. And, and most of the buildings, I think, that Adam, um, Danny, and Bennett buy here in the city are value-add with a lot less, um, you know, or if any, vouchers even. Questions? Well, we have time for one last question. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's okay. So, so vacancies are essentially zero, it sounds like. Rents are going up. Employment's pretty flat. I mentioned 85,000 last year. That's flat. The city this size. And the purchase market is very strong, people are buying it. Where are all these renters coming from? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, 
Yeah, New York is still attracting people from all over. I think that the 85,000 uh, number is, uh, there's an enormous amount of um, jobs which are not being reported in the New York area. A large immigrant uh, population from Latin America which is still coming to New York. And uh, you have an interesting phenomenon, you know, the first, the most affordable borrowers, they're coming, they're moving to the Bronx, and then the people which are in the Bronx five, six years and are doing better, they move into certain areas of Queens, and eventually they move to Brooklyn or, or stay in Queens. Uh, but uh, there is, um, you have now a lot of the, uh, a lot of the properties, that, that, the walk-up properties that you come up, 26 and younger that you're talking about, are coming up. And now, a lot of the tenants are coming from the uh, high-tech industry. Uh, there's a, there are a large number of employers which are setting shop here, and um, we've seen that in our portfolio, in both the medical field and, and in the high-tech industry in Manhattan, you have a lot of growth. In the other borrowers, there's just an enormous amount of demand from families, and, and, and just uh, uh, the tendency is there. You have also a lot of, um, you know, don't forget, New York still probably has something like about 100,000 to 150,000 units which are occupied by one person, an elderly person, which can't afford to move out because of rent control or rent stabilization. But that takes a lot of the market that really just catches it for, for future tenancy. But, um, I, I, you know, I'm not sure really, but the demand is there. As I said, you know, we don't look for tenants, they, they come look, knocking it out doors. I think one of the things that you're forgetting is there, there has been population growth over in you know, the last 20 years, and so you know your kids. Well, I guess in a few years, but at some point your kids are going to be moving into our apartments, and they're going to be sharing with their friends. And you know, all of a sudden, one of them gets married and or engaged, and now you know they have to find an apartment. So you have a lot of shared situations. I think the other thing is that New York, while you know it certainly is well built and established, there is a, a level, especially in uh, Bennett and you know, mind space that's transient. And so somebody's gonna come here for two or three or four years, uh, try to, you know, establish a uh, career here. Sometimes they're successful, other times they're unsuccessful, and then they'll move, they'll move away, or, you know, they'll move on to something else. But I still think that, you know, you're getting a lot of people who are, uh, I don't wanna say struggling, but you're struggling artist who's, you know, working uh, as a waiter at night is coming here. There's only, you know, three, four years that you can do that before get burned out, so I think you're seeing a lot of that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I just, you know, you, you you have to understand that a lot of what Adam and I do, the, the housing that we build is, for what it is, it's pretty luxurious. I mean, we're talking washer dryers, dishwashers, marble, uh, crown and base molding, and to only have to pay $1,200 a month for a bedroom, that's pretty affordable for New York City, maybe even $1,100. So, well, you know, we're in these neighborhoods and we're getting high price per square foot. Our price per bedrooms are, I mean, I think, very, very reasonable and very good for young people. So, I mean, anybody who comes out of college, anybody who's moving to New York, we're basically giving them what I like to think is the best option because uh, it's affordable, it's well located, and it's beautiful. So, I mean, I, I think there's always going to be a demand for that, uh, even if the job market's flat. One last thing about. Manhattan that is Tom Reddit's. Don't, don't rent apartments, they rent Manhattan, that's just a good place to, to stay. But, um, yeah, that's yeah. different. One last thing to remember about rents in New York City, it's still, it's a, it's a, it's a rent-stabilized city. So, artificially, the rents here are lower in most of the buildings, they're below market. So that helps, um, you know, that helps in the, in the demand side, just, just as a note. So I want to thank our panelists for today. We're incredible. Thank you very much for coming here. We'll stay here for a few more minutes if you want to speak with them individually. Um, I hope you have a few minutes to stay and uh, say hi to everybody here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you for meeting with us today thank and enjoy the show. Thank you very much.